Hey, it's Matt Fouch here, and I'm with my friend Dr. Robert J. Morgan. We both have done uh, different pieces that help preserve the history of the music of mm -hmm. our faith. I have a solo CD that tells the story behind the song, and then I sing the song for you all. Dr. Morgan uh, has written three volumes of a book called Then Sings My Soul. He's sold millions of copies. My CD has not sold millions of copies, but it either will. way, we're, it will. I, yeah, yes. maybe, we'll see. But either way, we are doing our part to preserve the history of the music mm -hmm. of our faith, and that's yes. the hymns of our faith. And um, we're talking today about why we feel like that is so important. Now, I want to say to begin with, and you can echo this in your own words, that um, in no way are we saying that we think that we should totally get away from music that's being written and sung today, and uh, we should only do hymns. We are simply sharing a perspective that we both agree on. Uh, why totally forsaking the hymns of our faith is a route that we do not want to continue to go down as a mm -hmm. church. So let's get into this. Why um, is it so important for us to make sure that we um, continue with the history of, of this music of, of the church? Yes, well, I agree with you. I tell people that the older people in the church badly need to sing the newest music because it keeps them fresh and young. and. Yeah. But the younger people in the church badly need to sing the older hymns because it keeps them connected with the heritage of their faith, which goes back for many generations. Matt, right. there are so many ways of answering your question. But here is one of the things that bothers me the most. Um, with most of today's contemporary Christian music, which I love, it doesn't tend to have a very long lifespan for any particular song. Uh, you know, for a long time we sang, for example, Shout to the Lord, which mm -hmm. was a great praise song. I loved it. But I don't remember the last time I sang that in a church now. It's sort of gone away. And, uh, and that's the way all of the songs are. They have a very limited lifespan, which means that it's very difficult for people now to develop a lifelong collection of hymns that stays with them from childhood all the way to death. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. I call it a personal canon of music. Wow. Uh, for example, when I was a boy, uh, I remember singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God Our Father, uh, you know, that wonderful hymn. Uh, and when I was a teenager, I sang it. When I went to college, we sang it, uh, there is no shadow of turning with thee, all I have needed thy hand hath provided. Uh, when I became a young pastor, we sang that hymn uh, all through the years. We don't sing it every Sunday. We sing it, you know, a few times a year, but over the years I've come to know it. I can quote the whole thing verbatim. Yeah. Uh, it's become a part, and, and when I'm on my deathbed, it's very likely that that hymn will be going through my mind. It is a lifelong part of my spiritual DNA, mm. as it were. Yeah. And we've got to have some songs like that. Yeah. Well, the older hymns, have, uh, they have survived the test of time. They've been around for a long time. And, and somehow they resonate with us. And I've had people who wrote me uh, because of this book and said that my grandfather was in the nursing home with Alzheimer's and he hadn't spoken for two years. He didn't know anyone, but we started singing the old rugged cross. And to our surprise, he came in and sang every word of the chorus with us. Yeah. These hymns go very deeply into our minds and hearts. And so to lose them as we are so close to doing would be catastrophic. And this is why I think it's a terrible mistake for churches to sing old hymns and songs and never sing the new ones. Or uh, conversely, why it's so dangerous for church, churches just to sing the newer songs and not to weave in the great hymns and gospel songs that have been a part of our heritage for hundreds and really literally thousands of years. That's right. Now, share with us a little <clears throat> bit of the history of uh, some of these great hymns of the faith. And you and I, you and I have had this discussion, oh. and I, I, you gave me a very in-depth 
uh, timeline. Uh, but give us the, the cliff notes. Is that what, what, yeah. what it was in school that we would go and get and kind of give us the brief overview of the history of hymnody uh, of the church? I'd be glad to. The hymn started with the Bible. So the first category of hymns, chronologically speaking, are the biblical hymns. And the first one was in Exodus 15. Uh, I will sing unto the Lord for his triumph gloriously. It was the hymn that they sang as they emerged out of the Red Sea on the other side, free from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And, and Moses wrote a hymn and Miriam sang it and they all sang it and they wrote it down in Exodus 15. So you can go through the Old Testament, particularly, of course, the book of Psalms. That became the hymn book of the Hebrews. And then in the New Testament, it begins with hymns, the Nativity Canticles, and the choirs over Bethlehem fields, and, and the Song of Mary and of uh, Zechariah. Um, and then we have some hymns in the New Testament that I think Paul wrote uh, and wove into his writings. And then we have the, uh, the great book of Revelation, which is full of hymns. Uh, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So those are the wow. biblical hymns. Yeah. After the end of the biblical era, uh, as the apostles were dying, the primary language was Greek. And so we have an era there of Greek hymns. And uh, we still have some of them that they, these were sang uh, right after the time of the Bible by the early church. And the hymn that is most commonly sung today, I don't know if you know it, it's sung primarily in more liturgical churches, but it's the Gloria Patre. Hmm. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was, is now, and so shall be, world without end, amen. It's a great anthem. I sing it. If you go to a high Presbyterian or Methodist church or something, it's often sang every Sunday. That is the oldest hymn, apart from biblical hymns, that is still commonly sung today. But we have several of those. And then the world began speaking Latin. So we have the era of the Latin hymn. And these are hymns such as, there's a wonderful Christmas hymn, it's one of my favorite, of the Father's love begot, and ere the worlds begin to be, his Alpha and Omega, he the source, the ending he. So we, we have a lot of hymns that come from this era, including St. Francis wrote in Italian, and it was translated in English, all creatures of our God and King, lift yeah. up your voice and with us sing. And O Sacred Head Now Wounded by uh, Bernard. We have a lot of hymns from this Latin era. But then came Martin Luther and the German Reformation and the introduction of German hymnody. And uh, uh, we, you know, most people will know, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. That was the rallying cry of the Reformation. But there are a lot of German hymns yeah. that are just my favorites. I think really, right now at least, they're my favorites. Uh, Joachim Neander wrote, Praise ye the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise him, for he is thy help and salvation. Mm -hmm. And Martin Rinkhart, right now this is my number one favorite hymn. I change periodically. <laughs> I was about to say, it probably transitions. Yes. But now think we all our God with hearts and hands and voices, who wondrous things has done, in whom his world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. I think that's one of the most beautiful hymns, both the music and the words, ever to be written. So we have those German hymns. And then here came the English, and we had the golden age of English hymns with uh, Isaac Watts. Uh, oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. And when I survey the wondrous cross, and Charles Wesley came with the great Wesleyan revival hymns. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? And, and oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. So we have about 150 years in which the British hymns, uh, with all of their majesty, yeah. sort of dominated the, the, the world. They would still sing the older hymns. Um, mm -hmm. Always up until now, they would still sing the older hymns, but they would also sing these newer ones. Yeah. Um, and then in the middle of the 1800s in America uh, and really around the world, but the Sunday school movement started. And so somehow some of these great German hymns weren't quite right for five-year-olds. <laughs> so, so we have the era of the Sunday school movement and songs like Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. And when D.L. Moody started his great campaigns after the Civil War, 
He wanted a softer, gentler, more personal, more subjective type of music. And Ira Sankey was his music director for the campaigns. And so they developed a genre of music today that we call the gospel song era. And those are songs like Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, and Have Thine Own Way, and hymns that are more personal and warmer. Yeah. And, and these kinds of songs really dominated uh, uh, the English-speaking world and, and really all of the world because they were translated until the late 1960s and early 1970s when with the countercultural movement, the, uh, uh, the hippies uh, in California uh, were converted. Uh, this was my era and began the, the era of the praise and worship music which we have today. But even, you know, in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, we had all this wonderful contemporary music. Yeah. And we would sing these songs, but we, not to the exclusion of the others, we would bring, Jesus said, Matt, that the wise man, he said this in Matthew 13, brings out of his storehouse treasures both old and new. Mm. And so wow. to, to, to have the heritage uh, and the depth of all of our history of hymnody, along with the freshness and relevance of the newest music, we need both of those. And that's why I just am not willing, I wanna sing the new music. Yeah. but I don't want to lose the great hymns that we love. That's awesome. We were talking earlier uh, and you were mentioning a, a thought of objective and subjective. And yes. I thought that was a great thought that these folks <clears throat> watching would really be able to connect with in a good way um, when they're listening to these different kinds of songs that are sung in church yeah. over the years. Explain that to the folks that are watching. Yeah, I think whenever you are singing or worshiping uh, or writing music or singing music, uh, that you ought to be thinking, I wanna balance here between songs that are objective and songs that are subjective. So objective hymns, and this is a very old discussion, I mean, this goes back for many, many, many years in uh, philosophy of, of hymnody books. But the objective hymns are very God-centered. They praise God for who he is not necessarily for what he's done for us, just for the uh, indescribable glories of his person. Yeah. Like, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, you know, is all about the holiness of God, or praise ye the Lord the Almighty, which I quoted mm -hmm. a few minutes ago, is about the God of creation. Uh, and so these are songs that, that glorify God for his attributes, for his characteristics, for his quality, for his eternal nature. Uh, we just praise God for who he is, and this is biblical. Mm -hmm. You know, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, uh, the whole earth is full of his glory, uh, it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, or the version of it in, in the book of Revelation, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to be. We just praise God for who he is. The mm -hmm. more subjective hymns praise him for what he has done for me. Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and uh, it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Uh, and so many of our, the gospel songs tended to be more subjective. The great English and German hymns needed to be, tended to be more objective. Uh, but it takes a balance of the two of them. And sometimes I like to sing a great objective song like Isaac Watts, I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. That says very little about what God has done for me. It talks about his matchless creative power and skill and design and ability. Other times, I like to sing like Francis Havergal had a wonderful song, Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone. As thou hast sought, so let me seek thy erring children lost and lone. Lord, I need you to do this for me, or I thank you for what you've done for me. That would be more subjective. Now, if you have all one or all the other, then you're missing something because in the Psalms, sometimes you had objective Psalms. So great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable and it's all about God. Sometimes you have subjective psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down by green pastures, mm. you know. So in the Bible, you have both woven together. 
So my fear is that we will become more and more subjective because an awfully lot of today's music, there are some phrases I'm hearing an awfully lot like chains being broken and running out of the grave and being set free and, and delivered from shame and these, these concepts are, and almost all of the songs, well, they're very good concepts. But there are a few uh, contemporary Christian songs that tend to be more objective. And we need some of those, whatever our you know, combination of the genre of the hymns in terms of style, yeah. we need to make sure that some of those hymns are praising God for just who he is yeah. and the wonder of his attributes and person. And some of them are, Lord, thank you for what you've done for me. That is so good. I've honestly never heard heard it put that way between the two, but it makes so much sense. You know, and just in my mind, I'm running through songs and I'm sure you that are watching are doing the same thing. You're running through songs in your mind and you're like, yeah, yeah, I get that. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, we're not being prophetic here or anything, but what is the future of the church if we continue down this path of, um, or your opinion or your thoughts on this, if we continue down this path of uh, totally forsaking the history of the music of, of the church? Well, I think it's a, it, it's a subject to me, Matt, that is combined with two or three things. The church in America, is going to be under more and more attack as time goes by, by these fundamentalist secular forces that just are very intolerant yeah. towards true biblical belief. Um, and so it is a time when Christians have got to grow deeper. And there are a number of um, conditions right now that are tending to make Christians more shallow and church yeah. life more shallow. And that's concerning to me. Uh, one, frankly, is that we have too many topical sermons and not enough expositional sermons. Uh, because when God gave us the Bible, there's 31,000 verses uh, plus in the Bible. But he didn't take 31 pieces of paper and write them down and throw them out of heaven like confetti. And we just grab one here and grab one there. He put it in a logical, unfolding book that needs to be studied in its context, which is exposition. So if we just take a verse here and a verse there and we come up with some good outline for it and, and preach that, and we're not showing the unfolding of the logic of God's word in our teaching or in our pulpit ministry, mm -hmm. that's going to make things more shallow. Frankly, I have a lot of concern about the uh, segregation that is taking place in worship right now in terms of age categories. I go to a lot of churches and the children have been shuttled off somewhere else. Even the middle schoolers and certainly the elementary children. Um, and I feel like that families need to be worshiping together. That, that second grader needs to be standing with his dad or mom singing the hymns and singing the new songs and, 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 and listening to that sermon. Uh, I think it can be done well. I grew up you know, in, in what we call big church. Uh, but I think that, that all of this niching of everything may be developing shallowness. And when we lose the hymnody, the heritage of the hymnody of our faith, uh, then that goes along with the biblical illiteracy that's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just is tending to make the American church shallow at a very moment when we've got to be deeper and more mature than ever. And I think to have maturity in our worship, we've got to have the freshness of new music, and we've got to have the depth and the history of the hymns. I tell people in their worship, tilt forward, but make sure there's a cable back that's <laughs> anchoring to the past. Right. And that cable just may be one great hymn in that service, yeah. you know, or maybe a couple of them. But if we lose that, then we are losing something Matt, I don't know if it will ever come back if yeah. we lose it. Yeah. So there's a story about a little boy who came to his mother and said, Mom, do you know that vase that has been in our family for many generations? Well, this generation dropped it. Well, I don't want to be the generation that drops yeah, it. That's right. And I don't either. 
No, I know you don't. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, that is great food for us to take in, digest, think about how it applies to your life, to your church, to your, your musical uh, options that you have to listen to. Um, and I think that if we can I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say start a, a revolution because that's not necessarily right. I think there right, is a resurgence. But, yeah. I really do believe there is a resurgence of hymnody in American Christianity. I'm seeing signs of it, some very definite signs of it. I think if we can continue yeah. that, I think that we can continue to preserve the history of the hymnody of the church, as you said. Yeah. And I thank you for your and, time. And you're a part in that. Yes, sir. Yes. And this, you are a big part, too. This album, what you're doing, and your love for the hymns, I am so grateful for that. Uh, thank you. And I'm grateful for you and the work that you're, you've you put in for the books and that you're continuing to do. And I know you speak across the country. Uh, do you have any of the talks coming up in the future about hymnody or, or anything like that going on? I do, I do lectureships at schools and colleges on it. And if people ask me in other settings, I'll be glad to do it. Most of my speaking is based on other books that I've written, actually. But I love, as you can tell, <laughs> I love to speak on the hymns, so I'm glad to do that anytime anybody will listen. So go to robertjmorgan.com, yeah. and you can inquire about having him at your church, your function, your, your music event, uh, whatever you have going on to speak about this topic or other topics. He has written many other books on many different topics. And you can go to mattfouch.com. You can get the music of the album that I've done. It's called The Story and the Song, Hymns of Our Faith. So thank you all so much for watching this and uh, God bless you guys. I hope that you have put Christ in the center of your life and you're living for him and taking little bits and pieces from this discussion and many others and uh, living your life to its fullest uh, with, for the God that created you and has something very special for your life. Thank you all so much.